اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سوره البقره اي نمبر 92 تو 103 ولقد جاءكم موسى ان موسى عليه السلام had certainly come to you he had certainly brought to you what did he come to you with bil bayyinati with the clear proofs ولقد لقد is a combination of lam mean surely and qad meaning in fact and remember that whenever these two words come together there is an implied oath right before laqad so laqad actually means wallahi by allah surely in fact so we see there are three words that are being used to give emphasis and why is that done to show that what is being stated is definitely a fact there is absolutely no doubt about it what is being mentioned is certainly a fact and remember that whenever laqad comes or whenever there is emphasis in the kalam in this way that there's so much you know emphasis on the certainty of something there are three reasons for mentioning it there are three reasons behind it the first reason is that the one who is being addressed is a denier meaning he does not believe in that which you say so laqad is used to show that this is definitely true believe in it so when is it used when the listener when the person who is being addressed is not a believer secondly laqad is used when the one who is being addressed is doubtful when he is not sure when he is in doubt about what is being spoken of so laqad is said that remove all doubts this is certain this is a fact don't be doubtful at all so laqad is also used to alleviate to remove all doubts thirdly laqad is used to highlight the importance of that which is going to be mentioned to highlight the great importance of that which is going to be mentioned laqad wallahi surely in fact certainly such and such happened what does that show the importance of that which is being stated so walaqad meaning there is no doubt about it believe in this be sure about this and know that this is a very important fact what that ja'akum musa bil bayyinat musa alayhi salam came to you o bani israel with clear signs we have done the word ja'a before it is from the root letters jim ya hamza and bayyinat is from the root letters ba ya nu bayyinat is a plural of bayyina and bayyina is used for a clear evidence because bayyin is that which is clear in itself so bayyina is an evidence that completely clarifies the confusion so what are these bayyinat that musa alayhi salam brought to the bani israel what are these clear evidences it refers to the miracles that he performed remember we discussed yesterday as well that it is ayat bayyinat that are shar'i as well as kawni so the tawra the scripture as well as the many other miracles that musa alayhi salam performed which proved that he indeed was the messenger of allah so what did these bayyinat do they clarified the truthfulness of musa alayhi salam for example what miracles did musa alayhi salam perform through the staff the many miracles that were performed with the staff for example it ate up all of the snakes and the sticks of the magicians right similarly the sea was parted with the staff similarly musa alayhi salam struck the staff on the rock and 12 springs gushed forth right so all of these miracles what did they prove that musa alayhi salam was indeed a messenger from allah that indeed what he was telling them was something that they should have followed it was allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who had sent him as their savior so 
we sent Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam came to you with the clear signs. But what happened? Summa then. Meaning after some time, instead of believing in him, instead of following him, instead of being grateful, what did you do? اتخذتم العجلة You all adopted the calf. What does it mean by you adopted the calf? You took the calf. For what? For worship. Notice over here that for worship as a God is not mentioned. Isn't it? Even in the verses that we read earlier about the similar issue, taking the calf as a God was not mentioned. The only thing that was mentioned was that you adopted the calf. Why? Because it was an act that is so disliked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah doesn't even mention that. You know when you dislike something a lot, you don't even like to talk about it? So similarly, اِتَّخَذْتُمُ الْعِجْلَةِ You just took the calf. For what? That's understood. I don't need to repeat it. I don't need to mention it again. It is not something worth mentioning. It is something that disliked. So you took the calf, meaning as a god, for worship, مِنْ بَعْدِهِ After him. What does it mean by after him? After Musa a.s. had gone to the Mount Tur to get the scripture. So after him, meaning after Musa a.s. had gone to Tur to receive the Torah. Ba'dihi has been understood in another way. Ba'dihi has been understood as that after he had come to you with all of these bayinat. Musa a.s. came to you with bayinat, with clear evidences that showed that he was indeed the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah is the one who saved you. Allah is the one who is your Lord, who is your God. But what did you do? After he came to you with all of those clear signs, what did you do? Instead of worshipping Allah alone, instead you began worshipping the calf. And by worshipping the calf, وَأَنْتُ ظالمون and you were wrongdoers. By worshipping the calf, you did zulm. Zalimun is the plural of the word zalim. And zalim is one who does zulm. From the root letters, la, lam, mim. Do you remember the meaning of the word zulm? What does it mean? Injustice. Before that, it means to reduce. Remember? It means naqs. Reduce. To reduce what? To reduce the right of the other. To reduce the share of the other. Do not give to the other what he deserves. So you did zulm. On who? On yourselves. How? By doing shirk. Also, against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? By reducing his right. You should have been grateful. You should have worshipped Allah only. But you began worshipping the calf. There was another meaning of the word zulm that I told you. What is another meaning of the word zulm? To put something where it does not belong. To place something where it does not belong. So the calf is a calf. It's a creature. It's a tiny creature. It's a baby creature. And what did you do? You made it with your own hands, a golden calf, and you put it at the level of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by doing this action, you committed a great injustice. Also, وَأَنْتُمْ ظَالِمُونَ And you all were wrongdoers. How? By committing the greatest zulm. By committing the greatest injustice. What is the greatest injustice? Shirk. We learn in the Quran that إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ Indeed, associating partners with Allah is the greatest injustice. So although they were believers of their time, because they worshipped the calf, what did they commit? Shirk. They committed shirk. وَأَنْتُمْ ظَالِمُونَ And you were wrongdoers. So over here we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rebuking the Bani Israel. He is reproaching the Bani Israel. Musa a.s. went to Mount Tur. For 30 nights. Initially, he went for how long? 30 nights. Which meant that he was supposed to be back after 30 nights. But when he got there, the period was extended to 40 nights. As we learn from another part of the Qur'an. Now when this happened, when Musa did not return after 30 nights, 
Samari, who was from among the Bani Israel, what did he do? He made the golden calf. And he said that, look, Musa a.s. has not returned. He did not find his God. Why? Because the actual God is this calf. Musa a.s. went in search of Allah. He did not find Allah. And the actual God is who? This calf who is in front of you. Therefore, you should worship this calf. And we learn that in Surah Taha, ayah number 88, where Samiri said, that هَذَا إِلَاهُكُمْ وَإِلَاهُ مُوسَى فَنَسِيَ This is your God and the God of Musa, but he forgot. Meaning Musa a.s. forgot his God. Meaning he doesn't know that this calf is actually the God. And he went up to Mount Tur to search for God. Now, the main thing is that he didn't go looking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He went because Allah called him to receive the scripture. And Harun a.s. he tried his best to make the people understand, but what did they do? They refused to leave the calf. And this ayah, this is connected with the previous ayah. What is the previous ayah? That when the Bani Israel were told, believe in the Qur'an, what was their response? We believe only in the Torah. Allah questioned them, if you say that you believe only in the Torah, why did you kill the messengers? And over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala questions them in another way, that do you really believe in the Torah? You don't believe in the Torah. Because Musa a.s. was the one who brought you the Torah. And when he was away for just some time, what did you do? You completely forgot all of his teachings. Everything he taught you, you left it, you abandoned it. And instead, you began worshipping the calf. So do you actually believe in the Torah? No, you don't believe in the Torah. So in these verses, what is happening is that the claims of Bani Israel are being refuted. Their justifications for not believing in the Qur'an are being refuted. So we learn from this ayah that the Bani Israel are being questioned about the sincerity of their faith in the Torah. About the sincerity of their faith in Musa a.s. Because when Musa a.s. brought all of the clear evidences, clear miracles, clear signs, after seeing them, they should have obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. Instead, they began worshipping the calf. And that shows that their faith is not sincere. So over here we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is questioning their claim. That they only claim to be believers, but they are not actually believers. Because if they actually believed, they would not have worshipped the calf. They would have believed in the Qur'an. So what are some of the lessons that we learn from this ayah? The first thing that we learn is that the Bani Israel, they worship the calf with zulm. وَأَنْتُمْ ظَالِمُونَ what does that mean? That they worship the calf out of injustice and not out of ignorance. Their act of worshipping the calf was not based on ignorance. Remember that when a person does an action based on ignorance, he is not really accountable for that. When he learns about that action, then he is accountable for that. But when they worship the calf, that was based on zulm. Because they knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the one who had saved them. They knew that Musa a.s. was indeed the messenger of Allah. And when a person does something wrong based on the zulm, then that wrong cannot be excused. Also we learned from this verse that the Bani Israel had reached the extent of wrongdoing. How? By worshipping the calf. They reached the height, the extent of doing wrong by worshipping the calf. You know, one is that people don't obey the messenger. But the other is that they begin to do shirk. They begin to associate partners with Allah. And when we look at the Bani Israel, we say, oh, how terrible. What were they thinking? What were they doing? But if we look at the Muslims as well today, they don't just worship a calf. But Muslims, they have many calves today. For example, Muslims, while being believers in the oneness of Allah, there are Muslims who go pray to the dead who go visit the graves, who make dua to those who cannot help them. It is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created us. It is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who deserves our worship. And when a person turns to others besides Allah, it shows 
that he has weak iman. It shows that his faith is weak. Because if the Bani Israel truly believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they wouldn't have said, Musa al-Islam has lost Allah. No. They would have still continued to worship Allah. So when a person turns to others besides Allah, what does that show? That his faith is weak. He needs to strengthen his faith. Also we learn from this ayah, that just if a person is a born believer, just because he is from a particular community, it doesn't mean that he can do whatever he wants to. He still has to follow the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just as the Bani Israel, just because they were chosen people, didn't mean that they could go worship the calf. Similarly, being Muslims today, doesn't mean we can go against the commands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Let's listen to the recitation. What? Then Allah says, وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِيثَاقَكُمْ And remember, when we took your covenant. Which covenant? To have faith. To implement the Torah. To act according to the Torah. وَرَفَعْنَا فَوْقَكُمُ الطُّورِ And in order to make you accept the mithaq, what did we do? We raised the mountain above you. When you refused to accept it. And what were the Bani Israel told? خُذُوا All of you take. مَا آتَيْنَاكُمْ بِقُوَّةٍ All that we're giving you with quwa. Now the words over here, need to be looked into detail. For example, over here Allah says, Khudu, all of you take. The address is not just to the leaders, not just to the scholars, but everybody. The entire Bani Israel. Similarly, if we have the Quran today, it's not just for the scholars. It's not just for some people, it's for everyone. Khudu, all of you take. All of you take what? مَا آتَيْنَاكُمْ Whatever that we have given you. What does it mean by whatever? Meaning everything. Not just parts of the Torah. Not just some teachings. Not just some commands. But all of them. And how should you take them? بِقُوَّةٍ With strength. We have done a similar ayah before. And this is a repetition just to remind the Bani Israel that remember this command as well. Remember this promise that you made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Now the question is, what does it mean by taking the book of Allah with strength? Taking the book of Allah with quwa. What does it mean by that? We have done this before. What does it include? Following the commands of Allah. So first of all it means believing. Because khudu, take it, meaning accept it. Believe in it. So believe in all of the teachings firmly without leaving anything out. We learned earlier about the Bani Israel, قَلِيلَ مَا يُؤْمِنُونَ One of the meanings was that their belief is limited, meaning they don't believe in everything that they must believe in. Over here, they're being told, خُذُوا مَا آتَيْنَاكُمْ بِقُوَّةٍ Accept it, meaning believe in all of it, Firmly, without leaving anything out. So that's the first thing that is included. The second thing is that all of you adhere to it firmly. Apply it. Implement it properly. Live according to its teachings. So first of all, believe it. Secondly, adhere to it firmly. Apply it. Implement it. Completely. بِقُوَّة With strength. Also what this indicates is a third part of this is that in your reading of the book, in your recitation of the book, in your application of the book, what should you do? Be consistent. Don't just read it once and then forget it for another 10 months. No. Be consistent. It should be a part of your life. Similarly, when it comes to applying the book, be consistent. Don't just follow one command at one occasion and forget it at another. No, follow it with consistency as well. So we see that in your reading, in your recitation, in your application, in your reflection, what should you do? Be consistent. So strength is consistency. Quwa is consistency. Be consistent and also be determined. Be serious. Don't be casual with it. Don't be non-serious with it. Don't be lazy with it. 
Don't be forgetful. Don't be careless. خُذُوا مَا آتَيْنَاكُمْ بِقُوَّةً Take whatever that we're giving you with strength, with determination. Meaning implement it properly. Also they were told, وَاسْمَعُوا And all of you listen as well. Now the word اسمعوا is from سم سين ميم عين And سم عن means What does it mean? To listen, to hear But remember that there are different types of listening The first type of listening is إدراك إدراك Which means To only perceive Meaning just to hear the words Just to hear the sound For example You hear somebody calling you You hear somebody talking You hear the birds chirping. You hear the doorbell ring. So what is this? The first type of listening which is of idraq. The second type of listening is of qubool, of acceptance. What does that mean? That what a person hears, he accepts it and he responds to it. So it is of qubool and istijaba. To accept and respond to what has been said, to what has been requested. To what has been commanded For example If somebody tells you Can you please bring a glass of water for me So hearing is That first of all You hear their words That's the first step What's the second step? To accept and respond To what you have heard So what does that mean? That you go And bring a glass of water For them So over here when the Bani Israel are told, وَاسْمَعُوا and listen. What does it mean by listening over here? That just listen to the commands? In one ear and out the other? No. What does it mean? That listen, accept, obey, follow. Do what you are being told to do. Do what you are being commanded to do. And also, إِسْمَعُوا can be understood in another way. That pay attention. Pay attention when you're being commanded. Pay attention when you're being told. Pay attention when your messenger is telling you something. Wasma'u. Listen attentively. Not with negligence. Qalu. They said. Meaning the Bani Israel, their response was, Samirna, we have heard. Wa'asayna, and we have disobeyed. Instead of saying, Samirna, وَأَطَعْنَا What did they say? سَمِعْنَا وَعَصَيْنَا عَصَيْنَا is from the root letters عَيْن صَادِيَ from the word عِصْيَان or مَعْصِيَ which means disobedience. And what is disobedience? It is to leave that which a person has been commanded with. What is disobedience? That a person leaves what he has been commanded with. What does that mean? He doesn't do it. For example, we as Muslims have been commanded to fast in the month of Ramadan. What is ma'asiyah? That a person says, I don't want to fast. I'm not going to fast. So first of all, ma'asiyah includes leaving the command. Leaving the obligation. Secondly, ma'asiyah also includes doing that which is forbidden. Doing that which is forbidden. So over here, what did the Bani Israel do? Samirna wa asayna. What does it mean by this? This has been understood as that Samirna, meaning yes, we have heard your words with our ears. We have heard what you have said, but we are not going to obey. Asayna. We will disobey the commands that you are giving us. We will disobey what you are telling us to do. You know, one is that a person says, okay, fine, I'll do it, and then he doesn't do it. And the other is that a person says, yes, I've heard, but I'm not going to do it. What is more rude? That he says, I'm not going to do it. And this is what they did. Samirna wa aslayna. Yes, we have heard your words with our ears, but we're going to disobey them by our actions. So they literally said, we have disobeyed, meaning we're not going to listen. Whatever you tell us, we're not going to do it. Whatever you tell us not to do, we are going to do it. We're only going to do that which suits us. It has also been said 
that what it means by Samirna wa Aslina is that they said Samirna by their tongues. They said Samirna by their tongues. They said that we have heard. But when it came to actions, what did they do? They disobeyed. Allah says, wa ushribu, And they were made to drink. Fi qulubihim In their hearts. In their hearts, they were made to drink. What were they made to drink? Al-ijla, the calf. Ushribu is from Sheen Raba, Sharab. What does Sharab mean? A drink. And Ushribu, this is a passive form. It means he was filled with or he was given to drink. What does it mean? He was given to drink. So Ushribu fi qulubihim. They were given to drink in their hearts. What were they given to drink in their hearts? Iju, the calf. Now what does it mean by this? You see, when a person drinks something, what happens? It becomes a part of their body. Isn't it? It is absorbed by the body. It is taken inside the body. Similarly, when you pour water on the soil, on the ground, what happens? It absorbs it. It goes in the soil. So over here, wa ushribu, this is figurative speech, and what this means is that they were filled with, they were drenched with, they were saturated with, they were infused with, they were filled up. Filled up with what? Filled up, meaning their hearts were filled up with the calf. What does it mean by their hearts were filled up with the calf? With the love of the calf. So in other words, their hearts were filled with the love of the calf. وَأُشْرِبُوا فِي قُلُوبِهِمُ الْعِجْلَ The love of the calf settled in their hearts. Just as water is absorbed in the body, similarly, love of the calf was absorbed in their hearts. In the Arabic language, when love or hate for something settles in the heart, when love or hate for something settles in the heart, then the word sharab is used to describe the intensity and the quantity of that particular feeling. Okay? Whenever love for someone or hate for someone, it settles in the heart. It settles in the heart. Then what do the Arabs do? They use the word sharab, drinking, to indicate the intensity of that love or hate or the great amount of that love or hate. And why is this expression used? Because if you think about it, once you pour water onto dry earth, the earth absorbs it. Right? And the water becomes part of the soil. It becomes part of the ground. Now, can you separate the water from the soil? No. Similarly, when you drink something, can you separate that from your body? Not completely, isn't it? Not completely. So similarly, what this indicates is that the love for the calf had settled deep in their hearts. They were not going to leave the calf. They were not going to leave the worship of the calf. They had settled upon it and they were not going to move. Others have said that what this means is that the love of the calf intoxicated their hearts in the way that wine does. In the way that wine does. That a person, when he is drunk, he doesn't think about what he's doing. He doesn't use his mind properly. He's overcome by that alcohol that he has drunk. Similarly, they were overcome by the love of the calf, which is why they couldn't see the reality as it is. Despite knowing the fact that Allah is the one who saved them, still, what were they worshipping? The calf. They were still worshipping the calf. Now the question is, why was the love placed in their hearts? Why? him, Because of their disbelief. Their disbelief in who? Their disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when they worshipped the calf, what happened? They disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a result, what happened? The love of the calf settled deep into their hearts. 
such that they weren't going to leave the calf at any cost. We learn from Surah Taha, ayah number 90 and 91. وَلَقَدْ قَالَ لَهُمْ هَارُونُ مِنْ قَبْلُ يَا قَوْمِ إِنَّمَا فُتِنْتُمْ بِهِ وَإِنَّ رَبَّكُمُ الرَّحْمَانُ فَاتَّبِعُونِي وَأَطِيعُ أَمْرِي And Harun a.s. had already told them before the return of Musa a.s. that, O oh my people, you are only being tested by the calf. And indeed, your Lord is the most merciful. Your Lord is not this calf. Your Lord is Ar-Rahman. So follow me and obey my order. What did the people do? Did they listen to him? No. قَالُوا لَن نَبْرَحَ عَلَيْهِ عَاكِفِينَ حَتَّى يَرْجِعَ إِلَيْنَا مُوسَى They said, we will never cease being devoted to the calf. We are never going to stop being devoted to the calf until Musa returns to us. What does that show? That their hearts were filled with the love of the calf. And as a result of this love, they couldn't even see the reality as it was. Harun a.s. was reminding them, this is not your Lord. Your Lord is who? Ar-Rahman. So worship Him. Don't worship this calf. But did they listen to Him? No. Why? Because of the immense love that they had in their hearts for the calf. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says over here, قُلْ سَيْ بِئْسَمَا يَأْمُرُكُمْ بِهِ إِمَانُكُمْ how evil, how bad is that what your faith commands you to do? Bi'sama. Bi'sa and ma. Meaning, how bad? Very bad. Very bad is that which ya'murukum. Ya'muru is from Hamza Mimra. And what does amr mean? Command, instruction. So how evil is that which it commands you? Ya'murukum bi. What commands you? Imanukum, your faith, your iman. They claim to be believers. Allah says that if you're really believers, then what is it that your iman is commanding you to do? It's commanding you to worship the calf? What kind of iman is this? You say we believe in what has been sent down to us. You say we believe in the prophets, in Musa. But do you actually believe in him? No, you don't. Do you actually believe in the Torah? No. بِئْسَمَا يَأْمُرُكُمْ بِهِ إِمَانُكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ If you're truly believers. So what does this ayah show? That you are not actually believers. You claim to be believers, but you're not actually believers. Why? Because iman does not command that a person worships other than Allah. So if your iman tells you that you should worship the calf, what you have is not iman. What you have is something else. So first of all, the ayah tells us that such people are not believers. Secondly, this also says, in kuntum mu'minin, if you're truly believers, that you don't believe in the Torah either. You don't believe in the Torah either. Why? Because you have disbelieved in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Whereas iman does not command you to reject him. So if what you have is telling you to reject Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, what you have is not actually iman then. You claim to be believers only, but you don't actually have iman. So what lessons do we learn from this verse? What lessons do we learn from this verse? The Bani Israel were told, خُذُوا مَا آتَيْنَاكُمْ Take what we're giving you with strength. What does that show us? That when it comes to deen, when it comes to practicing deen, we should use some quwa that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. We think that all of our strength, all of our energy is to be used for what? Shopping and cleaning the house and cooking the food and all of these worldly things. And when it comes to deen, we lack energy. We lack strength. We find it difficult to fast. We find it difficult to pray taraweeh. We find it difficult to recite the Quran. Allah is telling us that take the deen with strength. Take the Qur'an with strength. The Bani Israel were told, take the book with strength. And the same applies to us as well. There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he said that the strong believer is better and more beloved to Allah than the weak believer. The strong believer is A, he is better, and B, he is more beloved to Allah. Than who? Than the weak believer. 
while there is good in both. Meaning the weak believer is also good, but Allah loves more who? The believer who is stronger. And this strength is not just the physical strength, but it applies to the strength of iman, the strength of actions, the strength of conviction, the strength of determination, the strength of application, of being consistent with the deen. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, Wasma'u, listen, listen, meaning listen attentively. How do you know that somebody is listening to you attentively? When they respond, right? So when you don't respond, what does that tell me? So the Bani Israel were told, listen attentively, meaning respond to what you are being told. Respond to what you are being commanded. So it is not enough for us to just listen to the book, to just listen to the Qur'an, to just listen to the explanation of the words. What is required? Application. Amal is required. Also, we learn from this ayah that why did the Bani Israel disbelieve? Because of the love of the calf. وَأُشْرِبُوا فِي قُلُوبِهِمُ الْعِجْلَ بِكُفْرِهِمْ Because of their disbelief. So we learn that a person rejects the commands of Allah when when there is something else in his heart. What was in their hearts? The love of the calf. And because of that love of the calf, they were not going to obey the messenger. They were not going to worship Allah alone. With us, what happens? We know we have to pray. We know we should read the Qur'an. We know we shouldn't lie. We know we should be kind to others. But what is it that stops us? Why don't we do it? Why don't we obey Allah? Why? Because there is something else in the heart. There is something else which is taking more of our attention, more of our energy, more of our love. So every person has some form of ijl. The Bani Israel had the actual kaf, which was stopping them from worshipping Allah, which was stopping them from listening to the messenger. And we also have some form of ijl that prevents us from obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes it may be a person who is stopping us, the love of a person. Sometimes it may be a particular work or a particular custom, a particular tradition, a particular position that we want to have. It could be money, it could be fame, it could be praise, it could be the acceptance of other people. There could be many, many things. But all of us need to sit and figure out what is the ijil that is stopping me from obeying Allah? What is the ijil that is preventing me from moving forward in my deen? What is that ijil? What is that calf? And when there is something else that occupies us, then naturally we are distracted from that which is more important. For example, you may have seen children, sometimes they're watching the television, or even older people, they're working on the computer, they're checking their phone, or they're reading something, and the other person is trying to have a conversation with them, is trying to tell them, and if you say something else, they'll be like, what did I say? They have no idea about what you have said. Why? Because they are occupied with something else. We can only have one thing in our heart at a time. We cannot have many things at a time. It is either the love of Allah or it is something else. And if something else replaces the love of Allah, then it is something very dangerous. In the following verses now, some other claims of the Yahud, of the Bani Israel, are being refuted. They would give many explanations for not believing in the Qur'an, for not believing in the Prophet ﷺ. Many justifications. Sometimes they would say, our hearts are wrapped up. Other times they would say, oh, he's not of us, he's only for the Arabs. Other times they would say, we believe only in what has been given to us, not in what has been given to other people. Now they made some other claims, some other justifications for not believing in the Qur'an. For example, they would say that, نَحْنُ أَبْنَاءُ اللَّهُ وَأَحِبَّاءُ We are the children of Allah and His beloved ones. We can do whatever we want to. If we don't believe in the Qur'an, if we don't follow this messenger, 
we're not going to be punished. We can do whatever we want to. We're not accountable for our actions. We are the chosen people. So if we don't believe in this Qur'an, it's no big deal. Or they would say, وَقَالُوا لَنْ يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارًا None will enter paradise except one who is a Jew or a Christian. So because we are Jews, therefore we're going to paradise. And if we believe in the Qur'an, we will not remain Jews. Therefore, we're not going to believe in the Qur'an. So they offered many justifications for not believing in the Qur'an. Over here, they said that Jannah, paradise, is only for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refutes this claim. Allah says, قُلْ say إِنْ إِفْ كَانَتْ It was. If it was, what was لَكُمْ for you? What was for you? الدَّارُ الْآخِرَةِ The home of the hereafter. What is the home of the hereafter? Jannah, paradise. Remember, hellfire cannot be home. Because it is not a place of peace. So, Ad-Darul Akhir refers to paradise. So, if the home of the hereafter, meaning Jannah, it is for you, in the Allah, near Allah, meaning in the sight of Allah, in the decision of Allah, according to the decision of Allah, the home of the hereafter is for you. And how is it for you? Khalifatan, exclusively. Meaning it is not for anyone else but you. It is only you who is going to Jannah. The word khalisa is from the root letters kha, lam, sad. Have you heard of the word ikhlas? What does that mean? Sincerity. What does that mean? That a person does an action only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only to get reward from Him and nobody else. Only to get His praise and nobody else. Right? This is what ikhlas is. And it's also from the root letters kha, lam, sad. Khulus means when something is purely and specifically for someone. What does it mean? When something is purely and specifically for someone, not for anyone else. So khulus in deeds is that a person does an action purely and sincerely for who? For Allah, not for anybody else, exclusively. And this is basically from khalasa, which means when something is completely pure, and free from all extra things. When something is pure and free from all extra things. So khulus is to make an action pure for only one person, only one purpose, one goal. Okay? So if you claim that the home of the hereafter is for you khalisatan, meaning exclusively for you, and in Jannah, only you will be there. Jannah will be free from all others. Jannah will only have you. Only you are going to Jannah. Mindun in nas from besides people. Meaning from besides all of mankind. It is only you who is going to paradise. Allah says, Fatamanna wul maut. Then wish for that. Fatamanna is from the root letters. Mim nun ya. We have done the word amani earlier. It is from the same root letters. Amani are false hopes. And tamani is to have hopes, to desire for something, to long for something, to wish for something. So, fatamanna wul mawta. Then wish for maut. Wish for death. Why wish for death? Why wish for death? Because only when you die can you get to Jannah. So, in other words, if Jannah is only for you, if you are definitely going to Jannah, then what are you doing here in this world? Is this world a better place or is Jannah a better place? Jannah is. Is this world a place where all of your wishes will be fulfilled or Jannah? Jannah. Is it this world where you don't have to do anything or is it Jannah? Jannah. Then what are you doing here? What are you waiting for? Wish for death and go to paradise. In kuntum sadiqeen, if you're truthful. If you're truthful in what? In your claim, the Jannah is exclusively for you. Allah says, وَلَن and never. Notice, لَن. What does لَن mean? Never. Not at all. يَتَمَنَّوْهُ They will wish for it. They will never ever wish for death. أَبَدًا Ever. The word abad 
is from the root letters Hamza, Ba, Dal. And Abad gives a meaning of eternity. It gives a meaning of always. And when the word Abad comes after La or Lan or any word that gives a meaning of no, then Abad gives a sense of never ever. So لَنْ يَتَمَنَّوْهُ أَبَدًا What does it mean? They will never ever wish for that. They will never ever wish for that. Why? بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ Because of what their hands have put forward. قَدَّمَتْ is from قَاف دَال ميم. قَاف دَال ميم. قَدْم قَدْم means to step, to step forward. To take a step and go ahead. To take a step and move forward. And قَدَّمَ is to send something else ahead. To send something else forward. To advance. So قَدَّمَ it sent ahead. What sent ahead? أَيْدِي him, their hands. أَيْدِي is the plural of yet. So because of what their hands have sent ahead. What does it mean by ما قدمت أيديهم? ما قدمت أيديهم is used for actions that have been done. Actions that a person has done in the past. And this expression is used ما قدمت أيديهم because of what their hands have sent ahead. Why? Because what you have sent ahead is gone. Similarly, an action that a person has already done, it's done. He cannot go and alter it now. He cannot go back in time and try to change the action. No, you can't go back in time. You can seek forgiveness. You can do other things. But what is done is done. It is written. And hands have been used over here. Why? Because most of the actions, they're done by hands. For example, writing, cooking, cleaning. What do you use? Your hands. Even driving, you use your hands. Right? So, بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ Meaning because of the actions that they have done. Which actions are these? Which actions are these? Okay, for example, changing the Torah, committing sins, going against the laws of the Torah, worshipping the calf, killing the prophets, similarly, denying the Prophet wasallam. So, بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ Because of the wrong actions that they have done, they are never going to pray for death. What does that show? What does that show? That they realize their wrong actions. Again, they are not doing wrong because of ignorance. Just as they did not worship the calf out of ignorance, similarly they are not doing wrong because of ignorance. Allah says, Wallahu alimun, And Allah is always all-knowing. Bilzalimeen with those who do wrong. Meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of all of their actions. And He will recompense them accordingly. Then Allah says, وَلَا تَجِدَنَّهُمْ And surely you will definitely find them. You refers to the listener. Primarily the Prophet wasallam, and then after him, everybody who is listening to this ayah. وَلَا تَجِدَنَّهُمْ This is wa and la surely. Ta indicates you and then you have the letters jim and dal. Okay? The root letters are Wow, Jim, Dal. The root letters are Wow, Jim, Dal. Now you don't see the Wow over here. Why? Because it's of the Huruf Illa. Okay? And Wajada means to find something. What does it mean? To find something. To meet something. To come across something. And the noon at the end that you see after the Dal with the Shadda on it, this noon with the shadda is called noon thaqila. The heavy noon. Why is it heavy? It has a shadda on it. And it also intensifies the meaning. Which is why you translate this noon mushaddad as definitely. Certainly. So, wala taji danna, meaning surely you will definitely find you will definitely meet, you will definitely come across. Whom? Them. Who does them refer to? The Bani Israel. So, وَلَا تَجِدَنَّهُمْ Surely you will definitely find them. أَحْرَصَ nasi, Most greedy of all people. 
Ahras is from the root letters Ha, Ra, Sad, Hifs. And Hifs is used for greed. What is Hifs? Greed. It is used for eagerly desiring something. Strongly desiring something. And in particular it is used for a desire which is difficult to fulfill. Or in order to fulfill it, a person has to put in some effort. Hirs is what? Extreme desire for something, an intense desire for something, an intense longing for something. And in order to fulfill this desire, a person has to put in some effort. Or it is difficult to fulfill that particular desire. Why? Because sometimes it's not in your hands. Sometimes it's not in your hands. For example, a person has this longing to eat a particular food. Can he eat it right away? No. He has to go either buy it or he has to go cook it. Hmm? So he has to go through some difficulty in order to fulfill that desire. But it's an intense desire. So Allah says over here that you will find them as ahras. Notice the word ahras. Ahras. Remember I told you about that Arabic words have certain structures? Hmm? So ahras just has the word sadiq, kadib, zalim. It's a structure. One who is doing something. So ahras is on the structure of af'al. And this structure gives the meaning of an action of superlative degree. You know, you have good, better, and then you have best. Better and best. They're different, right? So similarly, ahras is like most greedy or greediest. One is greedy and the other is most greedy. So over here Allah says that you will find them not just greedy, but you will find the most greedy, greediest of all people. Greediest of who? Anas, of all people. For what? What are they most greedy for? Ala hayatin, upon life. What does it mean by this? That out of all people, they are the most greedy for life. They don't want to die. They don't want to die. They love life. Allah says, وَمِنَ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا And even from those people who do shirk. Meaning they are more greedy for life than who? Than those who associate partners with Allah. Now the word أَشْرَكُوا is from شِينَ رَا كَافْ شِينَ رَا كَافْ The word shirk is from the same root letters. What does shirk mean? To associate partners with Allah. The literal meaning of the word is to have a share in something. To be a partner in something with someone. To be a partner in something with someone. So shirk is to associate partners with Allah. That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the khaliq, na'udhu billah, shirk is what? That a person says that so and so shares in the act of creation. That Allah created and so and so also created. Na'udhu billah. Or for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's right is that He alone deserves worship. Shirk is what? To worship someone else. Allah's right is that a person should make dua only to Him. Shirk is what? That a person makes dua to others. He gives the share of Allah to others. He associates others with Allah. So Allah says that those people who do shirk, meaning the polytheists, even they are not as greedy for life as compared to the Bani Israel. How greedy are they for life? Yawaddu, he loves, he wishes. Yawaddu is from wal dal dal. Wal dal dal, wood, which is used for love. But it is used for intense love. Intense desire for something. Intense hope for something. But you know, hirs is more of desire and wood is more of love. So, yawaddu, he loves. What does he love? Ahaduhum, each one of them. What does he love? That, law yu'amma, 
if only he is granted a life of how long? Alpha sana, a thousand years. Each and every one of them loves that he should be given a life of a thousand years. Yu'ammar is from the root letters Ayn Mimra. The word Umr is from the same root, which means age, life. And the word Yu'ammar is understood in two ways. First of all, Yu'ammar is understood as that he is given a life. He is given an age of. Secondly, Yu'ammar is understood as that he is given a long life. He is given a long life. What's the difference between the two? The first is just life, just age. The second is long life. So each one of them loves that he should be given a life of how long? A thousand years. And secondly, what does it mean? That each of them wishes that he should be increased in his lifespan with how much? A thousand more years. What's the difference between the two? First is, each of them wants to live for a thousand years. The other is, that if a person has been given a life of 60 years, he wants a thousand more. If he's been given a life of 80 years, he wants a thousand more. Meaning he does not want to die, even when he has become extremely old. You know, sometimes you meet people who are very old, and when they become dependent on others, they worry about becoming more dependent on others. And what do they wish? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them death when they are still able. Right? So it is as if as they're approaching old age, they become more and more closer to death. But such people, the more aged they become, the more long life they want. يَوَدُّ أَحَدُهُمْ لَوْ يُعَمَّرُوا أَلْفَ سَنَةً But is long life going to remove them from the punishment? No. Allah says, وَمَا هُوَ And it is not. What is not? It refers to long life or a life of a thousand years. It is not بِمُزَّحْزِحِهِ In the least one that moves him away. From what? من العذاب From the punishment أَنْ يُعَمَّرُ Even if he's given a long life. The word بِمُزَحْزِحِهِ ب is Zaid over here giving the meaning of at all and muzahzih. Notice the word muzahzih begins with meme. What does that show? It's one who is doing the action. Right? And the word muzahzih is from the root letters zayha, zayha. Four letters. This is something new. Most of the Arabic words, they have root letters that are only three. Some have four. Some have five. Some have two. But generally, there are three. Okay? And zahzaha is to remove something far away. What does it mean? To remove something far away. Why? In order to protect it. In order to save it. So the long life is not going to remove this person away from the punishment, even if he lives for a thousand years. وَاللَّهُ بَصِيرٌ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ And Allah is seeing of what they do. So what do we learn from this ayah? That no matter how long of a life a person lives, he cannot avoid death. He cannot avoid hisab. He cannot avoid giving an account of his deeds. He cannot avoid judgment. He cannot avoid the hereafter. No matter how long a life a person may live, also we learn from this ayah that the life of this dunya is nothing compared to the eternal life of the hereafter. The life of dunya is how long? 60 years? 80 years? 100 years? Okay, fine. Even if a person is given a thousand years, it is still nothing compared to the life of the hereafter. Why? Because the life of the hereafter is eternal. Life of this dunya is limited. It is going to end. So what should be given preference? The hereafter. That which is eternal. That which is longer. That which is more important. So a person should never think that I'm too young. You know, I can wait. I'll do this when I'm older. Hmm? Or I'll live long enough to repent. When I'm 60, I'll go to Hajj. And all of my sins will be forgiven. No. A person should benefit from the life that he has been given. 
even if a person is given a life of thousand years, if he does not do good, that life is not going to benefit him. And if a person is given a life of twenty years, and if he benefits from that life, is that life going to benefit him? Yes. So what is it that matters at the end of the day? Is it the quantity or is it the quality? The quality. Is it the long life or is it the actions that a person does in that long life? Actions. We see that Aisha radiallahu anha, she was only 18 years old when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa passed away. But she had learned so much from him. And in that young age, she began teaching so many people. Don't wait to become old. Don't wait. Because it's not the quantity. It's not the age. It's about now. What do I do now? Also we learn about so many scholars who were 30 years of age, 40 years of age when they passed away. Imam An-Nawawi. How old was he? He was very young. But he left so many good books for us to benefit from. 40 hadith of Nawawi. Everybody knows about that. So many people benefit from it. So, we should benefit from the life that Allah has given us. No matter how short or how long it is. And we should not wait that I will do this tomorrow. Because we don't know when our life is going to end. Our chance is now. We will listen to the recitation. No matter how old we are, we should remember, Wallahu basirun bima ya'malun. Allah is watching every single action of mine, regardless of my age, regardless of how much time I have left. So I have to be careful about my actions. And not worry about my life, but worry about my actions. <laughs> 